Welcome to the 19th topic of the course. We're looking at programming languages in this video. Um, so high level, low level, and also two types of uh, translator you need to know about, the compiler and the interpreter. But let's begin by looking at what I like to call the programming language spectrum. So this is a uh, Wikipedia definition of programming language. Um, you can tell it's Wikipedia because it's a little bit uh, overcomplicated, but uh, if you want a definition that might be useful. But really um, what I'm trying to get at is we have a spectrum of programming languages. So at the bottom we have what is known as low level languages and so at the very bottom of the low level languages we have machine code and machine code is just binary zeros and ones directly executed by the computer. And then we have assembly languages which are also count as a low level language and then we move on to high level languages and at the very end um, we have maybe what we'd say are natural languages, so English, French, German, uh, and they're not programming languages, but it demonstrates the difference between machine code and natural languages in terms of high and low level. And then we have maybe uh, we have certain programming languages, so um, C, uh, C, C++ might be uh, slightly considered slightly more low level than Python is, so Python is quite close to sort of uh, the top, and so we have pseudocode, which is a high level plan. Um, and we have our normal languages. So uh, hopefully you can see kind of a progression from just binary at one end and we have words at the other end. So um, it becomes more like our languages as we uh, move up. And so the high and low, um, high level and low level refer to levels or of abstraction. So at the very bottom, machine code has not got much abstraction from the hardware. So um, it's very close to the hardware machine code because the hardware directly executes it. And assembly languages, really, uh, we've looked at these in the CPU video, but really they just replace machine code with words. So it's just like machine code with words. And so it's slightly further away, with slightly more abstraction, uh, it's slightly simplified more. Um, but uh, it's still pretty close to the hardware. Whereas something like Python, it's quite a difference between Python code and what's actually happening at the hardware level, um, which is where uh, the names come from, not something maybe you need to know. But anyway, um, so machine code, as we say, is the lowest level language made up of just zeros and ones. And so as we've looked at in the CPU video, it's written for specific processes because each processor has its own instruction set. And so some machine code written for one processor won't work on another processor because it will use a different instruction set. And that's what I'm trying to say here when you say it's not very portable. You cannot just move it around and execute it on loads of different computers. Um, but when it does, when it is written for a specific processor, it does execute very fast because it can be directly executed. Um, as you should hopefully appreciate, programming in machine code would be very impractical um, because code is made very long. If you think about when we were representing binary numbers, or sorry, representing uh, deanery uh, numbers in binary, they become a lot longer, and so any anything really in binary is going to be longer, and trying to find errors in just zeros and ones is going to be incredibly difficult, and so, you know, it's very difficult to program in. Uh, so assembly languages were kind of uh, invented, and so these are also classed as a low-level language. Really, we only class machine code or assembly languages as low level, um, although it is kind of uh, judgment. Um, so as again we've looked at, um, they're slightly more programmer friendly because they use these mnemonics like add, and as I say they just kind of replace the machine code with words to make it easier for, pro for programmers, and they're designed for programming hardware directly, so people, people do code in assembly languages and lots of control because you can like directly change registers. Also. Um, People maybe would use assembly language for programming, you know, small, simple, maybe embedded devices like the microcontrollers we looked at in a couple of videos ago, because you don't need many commands and they're going to be relatively simple too. So um, high-level programming languages are what um, hope I mean you have experience with both assembly languages and high-level ones too. So these are even more like our ordinary languages and they're far easier to use. Although we do have this strict syntax, so um, you need to be careful about that. They are more portable, um, meaning that you can write on one computer and then execute it on many others. But you have to use a translator, and they're designed more of usability and simplicity in mind than efficiency because they don't execute as fast as machine code would. But they're obviously far easier to use. So let's talk about um, what we mean when I say here that uh, source code hasn't been translated yet. So the source code is just for sort of written original code um, yeah, on your screen. So a translator is a program that converts code from one language into another. And to execute code, it needs to be translated to machine code. So if you write an assembly language, it has to be translated to machine code. 
and the same high level language as you too. So you need to know two types of high level translators and these are the compiler and an interpreter. So um, both of them are converting from high level to machine code, uh, kind of. So a compiler scans through the whole code and translate it all into object code. So when I said kind of, I mean um, we get object code. So the object code is the output of the compiler. And so object code, you can probably get away with saying it's a version of machine code, or you could probably replace object code with machine code because this is only GCSE level. Um, if we try and explain this too much, it's slightly dangerous territory because um, it's kind of to do with the portability. Um, the object code may need to be um, so, okay. So, so modern translators are very clever, um, and to make it as generic as possible, they're often tr uh, ex uh, translated to an intermediate stage, and then a final translator will translate it to the machine code that can be executed. And so, the object code might contain some instructions for the next translator to be used, not one you need to know about. Um, but it's not the original. Um, it's not. Um, it's in binary, so it can be directly executed in most cases. So before the compiler uh, compiles the code we have source code and after we have object code. So kind of the input to the compiler is the source and the output is the object code. Um, so after you compile a program you can directly execute it by the processor if this extra step doesn't happen and you can so you can create an executable file. Um, and uh, once it's been translated you no longer need the compiler or the source code which is really good because um, it means that you can discard this and just send people this executable file and so it's very it's harder to reverse engineer the interpreter um, has the source code at all times so anyone can look at the source code and if you're trying to sell some software you don't really want that so it can be good to use a compiler and also it's good because execution is fast because the object code can be then executed immediately um, but when changes are made to the source code and this is quite an important point you need to fully compile it again so any changes when you're maybe debugging or just developing the code you know everyone makes small little changes and tries to you know, and tries the code if you are going to do this you have to compile it every time you know if the object code doesn't change automatically you actually have to run for com uh, use the compiler again so it will take a long time if you have to do this so that's why an interpreter might be used uh, again this is high level to machine code and so the interpreter translates line by line so it translate translates a line of code then immediately executes it uh, the compiler just produces this object code that can then be executed whereas an interpreter does it line by line so you get an immediate response and so um, kind of what I was talking about it may translate to an intermediate form then it will execute that or it will make use of stored basically pre-compiled subprograms so this is a point you probably don't need to worry too much about um, so uh, I guess from what I'm trying to say is it's not always clear cut whether a translator is a compiler or an interpreter. So an interpreter may use things that have been pre-compiled just to save time. So they, they often use the same kind of, I guess you'd say, technology um, to try and make it as quick as possible. So yeah, maybe don't worry about that line too much. Um, this is quite important though. Program code needs to be translated every time you use an interpreter. Um, so whenever you try and execute some code, um, when you're going to use an interpreter, you have to execute. You have to translate it every time. So instead of just a compiler producing this output, you can just sort of double click on or uh, execute. Um, you have to use the interpreter every time you want to use the code or run the code. And so overall, it's going to be slower than a compiler. And often, interpreter code um, when you're executing it is actually slower than uh, a compiler too. So it's slower kind of in both ways. Um, but it is more flexible and during testing especially so that's when we're making these rapid changes or you know during development you can execute small sections of code anyway you don't need to compile the whole code in order just to te test a small section and it's more flexible in that way also portability wise it's slightly better um, but we won't go into details about that because it's probably way beyond your course uh, so that's it for this video um, a lot of information I'm afraid but uh, I think questions will be relatively simple. Just make sure you learn what uh, has been written in, uh, in this video. Uh, so, thanks for looking at networks. So, thank you for watching.